title of my presentation is Myth, Literature and Hermeneutics. It is Myth, Literature and Hermeneutics. And I have divided my lecture, I have divided my presentation into four units or into four parts. In the first part of my lecture, I'll be talking about what is myth and I will be articulating the characteristics of myth. So that is the first part. In the second part, which constitutes the core of my presentation, I'll be talking about famous myth scholars. I'll be referring to their important publications and I'll be highlighting their theories and insights. So that will constitute the second part of my presentation. That will be the core of my presentation. In the third unit, very briefly, I will outline the connection that exists between myth on the one hand and literature on the other. So this is a very brief section. And towards the end of my lecture, I'll be talking about what is hermeneutics, just one slide, and what is myth hermeneutics. And I will also underline the need for myth hermeneutics today. So this is roughly the scheme of my presentation. So dear friends, the first part of the presentation, I'll be addressing two questions. The, the, the first question, what is myth? and what are the features or what are the outstanding or the salient features of myth. Now, as students of literature, we are all very familiar with myth. As students of literature, we are familiar with Greek mythology, with Roman mythology, with Egyptian mythology. And as Indians, we are familiar with the Ramayana, the Mahabharata. So therefore, the question, what is myth? is not a very difficult question to answer. It is an easy question. Because as students of literature, as Indians, we are familiar with myths, whether they are literary myths or religious myths or myths in the anthropological sense. All of us know myth is a story. Okay, so this is how myth is described, whether it is by writer or by Kirk or by Ruthman. All experts in this particular domain, they talk about myth as a story. Okay, so to them, Myth is a story, it is a narrative, it is a tape. Now the point is, once you describe a myth as a story, a tale, a narrative, then a series of questions follow. Okay, who wrote this story? When was this story written? Who are the main characters? And what is the purpose of this story? Okay, so these are some important questions for which we have to answer. Fine. Now, the first thing that we have to remember is myth is a story, it is a narrative, it is a tale, but what kind of a story is it? It is a sacred narrative in the sense it is about gods, it is about goddesses, it is about demons, it is about asuras. Okay, you take the Ramayana and Mahabharata, that makes it very clear that myths are about gods and goddesses, about demons and asuras, or you take the myth of Orestes, or you take the myth of Oedipus, or you take other myths, they all make it very clear that myth is a narrative, but predominantly, not exclusively though, predominantly it is a sacred narrative. It is sacred because who are the characters who appear in myths? Predominantly gods and goddesses. And of course, you have the negative version of gods and goddesses. So that would be the demons and asuras. Fine. Now here, some of you may like to raise a question. Is it that all myths are about gods and goddesses or about demons and asuras? No, the answer is yes and no. I said predominantly to a very large extent, to a very great extent, myths, whether they are from a literary point of view or from a religious and anthropological point of view, they are about gods and goddesses. But we do have myths wherein we do not come across any gods or goddesses. And G.S. Kirk, G.S. Kirk is an authority on myths. Okay, particularly he is an authority on Greek myths. So he has written a wonderful book with the title Myths. There he says, you take the example of the myth of Oedipus. You don't come across any gods or goddesses. And you also take the example of the Gilgamesh myth. That also isn't about gods and goddesses. So the first thing that we have to remember is a myth is a narrative, but it is a sacred narrative. Sacred in the sense, the principal characters, the protagonists, happen to be gods and goddesses, fine. Now, when we talk about stories that Shakespeare has written, that 
Jane Austen has written, the Thomas Hardy has written, then we ask, when was this story written? When was Macbeth written? When was Pride and Prejudice written? When was the mayor of Casterbridge written? Okay, so if we define myth as a narrative, as a story, as a tale, then we need to raise this question, what about the time? When was it composed? When was it written? Okay, now as parents, okay, I, I, I'm sure most of us are parents and when we tell our children stories, okay, so to make it interesting, we say long, long time ago or once upon a time. Okay, so this is how almost all bedtime stories begin. Now, when we talk about myth, when were they composed? Okay, so here the answer is they are situated in in nilo tempore. So this is a Latin expression which means it is beyond time, it transcends time, or to use another English expression, it belongs to the primordial time. Okay, so the question is. What is a myth? So myth is a sacred narrative and it belongs to in nilo tempore, the primordial time. Next, we will briefly talk about the authorship. Who wrote Pride and Prejudice? The answer is, of course, Jane Austen. Who wrote uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man? It is James Joyce. Who wrote uh, the financial story? It is a financial expert. It is R.K. Narayana. Now, in the same vein, we will raise two questions. Who is the author of the Oedipus myth? Or who is the author of the Ramayana myth? Okay, so we do not have any concrete answer. Even though we do have certain answers, we do not have any concrete answers. Now, the reason is, as we all know, myths belong to the oral tradition. Because they belong to the oral tradition, it is difficult to narrow down the authorship to a particular individual. We say it was Thomas Hardy who wrote the mayor of Casterbridge. We can bring it down to a particular individual called Thomas Hardy, but then when we talk about the myth of Oedipus or the myth of Orestes, of course we say Aeschylus wrote it. Okay, but very strictly speaking, it was not Aeschylus. Why? Because this particular story existed in the oral tradition, it has a long history and it has many versions. So probably one particular version was collated and edited and put together by Aeschylus and therefore we attribute it to Aeschylus. But then we do know for sure that he is not the original author. So therefore, when we talk about myth as a story and when we talk about the authorship, we realize that because they belong to the oral tradition, they have a collective authorship because in the oral tradition, we have many versions and it is anonymous, okay? When we say Homer is the author of the Iliad and when we argue that Homer is the author of the Odyssey, okay, so what exactly does it mean? It, it, it was not actually Homer who wrote the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey. These stories already existed in the oral tradition. Maybe there were many versions. So all that Homer did was he collated them, put them together, edited them, gave it a form, gave it a shape, gave it a configuration. And that is why we attribute it to Homer fine. Now, the next important character of myths is we need to talk about the etiological character. <coughs> Now the word etiology, sometimes they spell it with an A at the beginning, and in some cases the A is removed. In any case, what is the meaning of etiology? The meaning of etiology is if you look into the dictionary, the dictionary tells us it means to talk about the origin. Okay. Now, some of the profound questions in life, some of the existential and profound questions in life would be like, when did evil enter this world? When did death enter this world? When did man become mortal? When did man become weak and fragile? Okay, so these are some of the questions. And when we look for answers to these questions, when we search for answers to these questions, that invariably takes us to the domain of mythology because mythology, that provides us answers to some of the basic, fundamental, ultimate existential questions like what is death? When did evil enter this world? When did man become mortal? So therefore, we underline the etiological dimension of myths. <clears throat>
Now, the next point that I would like to highlight is what exactly is the connection or what exactly is the association between myths on the one hand and rites and rituals on the other? Okay, now we need to turn to two anthropologists, Victor Turner and Clyde Lachon, because these two gentlemen, these two anthropologists have talked about the connection that exists between myths on the one hand and rites and rituals on the other. Now, before I throw some light on the connection between these two, like very briefly, like what exactly is a ritual? Okay, ritual. Uh, normally we talk of religious rituals, but then we also have academic rituals. Okay, so when you begin a function, there should be an introduction and there should be a vote of thanks. Okay, so in between you, you, you do a few other things. Okay, so these are academic rituals. Okay, so whether it is a religious ritual or an academic ritual, we know a repetitive action, anything done repeatedly in a particular pattern, Okay, if you have to go around the fire three times, it is only three times, not two times, not four times, not three and a half times. So it has to be done in a particular pattern, exactly in a particular pattern. So that would be a right and ritual fine. Now Turner, Victor Turner and Clayton, Clay Clayton would tell us why this particular right and ritual, what is the theoretical justification? What is the rationale? Okay, so the justification is provided by myths. Okay, so you have the action that would be the domain of rites and rituals and the theoretical justification for performing or undertaking a particular rite and ritual. That story is given to us by myths. So this would be the correlation between myths on the one hand and rites and rituals on the other. Now, the next dimension is we need to talk about the normative dimension. In, uh, in fact, interestingly, as students of literature, we all know Aristotle has already talked about it, ethos and mythos. Okay, so here the point is, the connection is, myths talk about the normative dimension. Okay, because in the primitive society, during the primordial time, when they did not have any book of constitution, when they do not, did not have a law book, when they did not have a rule book, when they did not have a book of guidelines as to how men and women should conduct themselves in societies. Okay, so it was myths that provided the normative dimension or the normative character. For instance, you take the myth of Oedipus that is supposed to perform an important function Okay, so one of, the, one of the glaring issues in the primitive society was incest. Okay, so they did not know how to address incest. So it was in this context that they had the myth of Oedipus because that gave the norm as far as incest is concerned. Now, the last dimension as far as myths are concerned is the fabulous character and the element or dimension of numinosity. And I would like to use the Polynesian word mana. So in other words, you have a horse that can fly. You have an animal that breathes fire or you have a character, half man, half, half animal who can carry an entire mountain. So what happens? your wonder struck. So experts talk about the fabulous character of myths. They are extraordinary. They are supernatural. As a result of which, look at the Latin expression. And it was coined by Rudolf Otto in his book, The Idea of the Holy. Okay, so when you look at these supernatural characters performing astounding deeds, like carrying a mountain, like flying, like breathing fire, so what happens? You're filled with awe and at the same time fear. So tremendum yet fascinants. You are fascinated, but at the same time, you're a little frightened. Mom. So dear friends, so that marks the end of the first part of my presentation. So in the first part of the presentation, I have done two things. Number one, I have defined myth. So myth is a narrative or a tale. And I have also spelt out the various features or the outstanding or the salient features and characteristics of myth. So this is the first part of the presentation. Now in the second part of the presentation, I'll be drawing your attention to some of the key myth theoreticians. I'll be, talk, I'll be talking about some six or seven key theoreticians and I'll be highlighting their 
insights. Okay. Now, the first one I would like to talk about is a philosopher, a German philosopher, Ernest Cassirer. He lived from 1874 to 1945. And he has written a number of books. He's called a neo-Kantian as far as his philosophical affiliation is concerned. Now, as far as mythology is concerned, in 1955, he wrote a book called Mythical Thought, which is the second volume of his book, The Philosophy of Symbolic Forms. Now, the important question is, what exactly was Cassirer's contribution to mythology? Fine. Now, I'll put it in a single word. Please go to the second paragraph. Mythical thought, according to Cassire, is primitive, but at the same time, it was a necessary and integral stage in the development of human culture. So in other words, how did human culture develop across time? Okay, now Cassire would tell us we have three phases. Phase number one, myth. Phase number two or stage number two, language. And stage number three or phase number three, science. So we have three phases, myth, language, and science. Now, Cassidy would tell us science, that is an advanced state as far as the development of any culture or any society is concerned. So science, rationality, marked by rationality. So that marks the growth and development of any society or any culture, whereas myth would be the basic stage, the primitive stage. So you start with myth, then you evolve, and then you reach the second stage, namely language, and ultimately the culmination would be the domain of science, which is marked by rationality. So his argument is, we have three stages in the evolution of any society or culture, namely myth, language, and science. Science would be the most advanced state, whereas myth is the most primitive stage. But then the point that he underlines is, even though myth is primitive, it is an important stage, it is a necessary stage, it is an integral stage, and it cannot be skipped. So this is Ernest Cassire and his contribution to the domain of mythology. Next, we come across a very interesting man, and that is Bronislaw Malinowski. <coughs> he lived from 1884 to 1942. He was an anthropologist. Now look at his name, Malinowski. So immediately you can jump to the conclusion. He must be a Russian or a person of Russian origin. Okay, so this man was Polish. He was a Pope. Okay, so how do we look at Bronisla Malinowski? A Polish-born British anthropologist who was a contemporary of Sir James Fraser. As students of literature, particularly, we are all exposed to Eliot, the Wasteland. So we all know the, 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 the Golden Bough and its author, Sir James Fraser. Okay, so Malinowski was a contemporary of Fraser. So who was Malinowski? A Polish-born British anthropologist and a contemporary, I would like to add one more word, a rival of Sir James Fraser. So why was he a rival? Fine. No, there is a very interesting story. So Malinowski and others, they accused James Fraser of being an armchair anthropologist. Okay. Now, as students of literature, we are all familiar with at least to some extent, like uh, what is anthropology, what is sociology, and what is philosophy. Now, we all know that an anthropologist, you should be spending more time in the field rather than in the classroom or in the library. Okay, so in other words, anthropologists need to undertake extensive field work. Okay, they should play the role of ethnographers, and then they have to go out into the fields in search of data, data collection. Okay, so the accusation is uh, James Fraser spent most of his time sitting in the library and his students and disciples would go to different parts of the world collecting data. So there was a rivalry between the Cambridge anthropologies on the one hand and Malinowski and others. Fine. Anyway, that is a different story. Let us not worry about it. Okay, but the point that I would like to uh, underline is this. An anthropologist is required to go out into the field live with the people, 
and collect the data. So this man, Bronisla Malinowski, the Polish-born British anthropologist, he spent seven long years, I repeat, he spent seven long years with a particular clan, a primitive society. Okay, they are called pro Brian Islanders. So he lived with them for seven long years and that was part of his field work. Okay, so after seven years, after his field work, lasting seven years with the Throbrine Islanders. Please go to the last line. He published a book bearing the title Myth and Primitive Psychology. So this was in 1948. Now this book, it is an interesting book, not very long, uh, maybe around 150 pages. There is only one argument. What is that argument? The role that myths play in primitive societies. Okay, so Malinowski was not concerned about the etiological dimension of myths. Okay, so in my first slide, I have already talked about what is etiology, talking about the origin. Okay, answering questions like when did death enter the world? When did suffering enter the world? So then you go to the realm of mythology because it is etiological. Okay, so we have two contrasting positions. On the one hand, they were anthropologists and others as well who, who, who were talking about the etiology of myths. And in contrast, there was another group, Malinowski and others, who were not interested in the etiological dimension of myths. Instead, they were functionalists. They were utilitarians. They wanted to address this question, what is the role played by myths in the lives of people? primitive society. Okay, so this was the question that they wanted to answer. And because of this, they were called functionalists. Okay, they belong to the school of functionalism. Okay, fine. Now, having lived with Trobrain Islanders for seven long years, Malinowski came to the conclusion that myths played a very important role in the lives of these primitive societies. And what role did it play? Okay, so please look at the quote from Myth and Primitive Psychology published in 1948. Myth is a vital ingredient of human civilization. And what exactly was the role played by myths in primitive societies? It was a pragmatic charter. Look at these two words. The entire book could be summed up, could be crystallized in these two words, pragmatic charter. If I can condense it in one word, I would like to use the word normative. Meaning, the primitive people, even though they were primitive, they too needed a book of laws, rules and regulations. Okay? And since it was a primitive society, a pre-literate, I will not say illiterate, a pre-literate society, they did not have any printed books. Okay, this is what you should do. This is what you should not do. No, they did not have access to such rule books. But at the same time, they needed a pragmatic charter. And this pragmatic charter, this normative dimension was provided to them by pens. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is about Malinowski the Polish-born British anthropologist, he talked about the role, the pragmatic role, the functional role, the utilitarian role played by myths in primitive societies. Okay, fine. Dear friends, next we move to a very important man. And there is also an Indian connection. I will talk about the Indian connection a little later. Okay, now this man is a giant a giant not only in the field of mythology, but in the field of phenomenology of religion. Okay, so this is a Romanian, Mircea Eliade. He lived from 1907 to 1986. Basically, he was a Romanian or because of the internal strifes, internal problems. He exiled himself and emigrated to the United States of America where he founded, where he established the school of phenomenology of religion. So he was a big name in phenomenology of religion. Now, as far as the domain of mythology is concerned, he has two important books. The first one was published in 1960, bearing the title Myths, Dreams and Mysteries. And the second book came out in 1963, bearing the title Myths and Reality. So these are two important books.
And both these books are readily available, Myths, Dreams and Mysteries, Myth and Reality. And uh, he is also the general editor of this famous encyclopedia, multi-volume encyclopedia called Encyclopedia of Religion. Okay, I'm sure your libraries have this encyclopedia. It is a wonderful volume, Encyclopedia of Religion, a multi-volume book. And the chief editor is Messia Eliade, a Romanian who specialized in mythology and later became a big name in the field of phenomenology of religion. Now we have to, the, the most important question that we have to raise is, now what exactly was Eliade's contribution to the domain of mythology? Fine. Now, before I answer this question, I said there is an Indian connection. Uh, I, I, I thought I'll very briefly talk about the Indian connection. So this man, he was in Calcutta for more than three years. And what did he do in Calcutta? Okay, he did his PhD in Indian yoga. So that was the Indian connection. Okay, there is another Indian connection and it is not proper for me to talk about it in this forum. Anyway, so he did his PhD in Indian yoga. He spent a little more than three years in Calcutta and the result was the, he earned the PhD in Indian yoga. Fine, now, now let us come back to the domain of mythology. Okay, now the question is, this is the question that we raised in relation to Cassire, what was his contribution? And also Malinowski, what was Malinowski's contribution to mythology? So we will raise the same question. What was Eliade's contribution to mythology? Fine. Now I'll talk about three important points. Now he's a big name. So therefore I will spend maybe another five minutes talking about the significant contribution of Eliade. Fine. So there are three significant contributions. Number one, he talked about three categories of myths, or to put it a little differently, he divided myths or he classified myths into three categories. Myths of cosmogony, myths of anthropogony, and myths of theogony. You have it on the slide. Myths of cosmogony, myths of anthropogony, and myths of theogony. In other words, what are these? Myths that deal with or myths that talk about the creation of the cosmos, the genesis of the cosmos, cosmogony. Gani means genesis, creation. Okay, so myths that talk about the creation of the world, myths that talk about the creation of man and women, creation of human beings, and myths that talk about the creation of gods and goddesses. So cosmogony, creation of the world, cosmos, Anthropogony, creation of the anthropos, creation of men and women, human beings, and theo. Theo is a Greek word meaning God, so the creation of gods and goddesses. Now, I'll give you some examples. Okay, now you take uh, the Bible, the Holy Bible. The, the, the first book of the Bible is called the book of Genesis. And as students of literature, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, we are all familiar with the book of Genesis, so it talks about how God created the world, how God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, the plants. Okay, so that would be a very good example of the myth of cosmogony. Okay, once again, you go, go back to the Bible, the book of Genesis. After creating the world, what did God do? God created Adam and Eve. God created human beings. So that would be a very good example of anthropogony. Now, for theogony, I would like to take an Indian example. Fine. Now, the question is, how was Goddess Durga created and why was she created? Okay, so we all know the story of the buffalo demon, Mahishasura. So, there was a buffalo demon and nobody could tame the buffalo demon. So, ultimately, they had to create a goddess. And who created? Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu. Out of their anger came forth rays of light and that created goddess Durga and she eventually destroyed the buffalo demon. So this is a very good example of theogony. Okay, so three important contributions of Mitsya Eliade to the domain of mythology. Number one, he classified myths, he categorized myths, a taxonomy of myths, cosmogony, anthropogony, theogony, fine. That is the first one. Now the second one, the second one is interesting. Uh, 
Now, what he did, what he said was, you look at all religions, whether it is Hinduism or Christianity, so all religions tell us that once upon a time, human beings were in paradise, meaning there was no death, there was no suffering, everything was fine, everything was perfect. Then what happened? There was a transgression. Man disobeyed. Milton talks about man's disobedience as a result of which he lost the paradise. Paradise lost. Okay. So what happened was because man was thrown out of the paradise, paradise lost, what happened was there was a transition or passage from, look at the last line, profane time, sacred time to profane time. As long as men were in paradise, as long as men and women were in paradise, they were close to God. And it was the sacred time. Once they lost the paradise and were expelled and thrown out of the paradise, from the sacred time, they, they moved to the profane time. Okay, so the transition from the sacred to the profane. Fine. I said I will highlight three insights of Iliade. So the first is how he divides myths into three categories. The second one is... He talks about how men were in paradise, men and women were in paradise, sacred time. Once they lost paradise from the sacred time, they were pushed to the profane time. And you would like to know what is the third insight. The third insight is in all human beings, whether you're religious or otherwise, whether you're theistic or atheistic, in, internally, deep within you, there is a longing, there is a yearning, there is a desire to get back from profane time to sacred time. And that is why we go to temples, we go to churches, we undertake pilgrimages, we break coconuts, we light candles, we engage in rites and rituals. The reason is we have lost the paradise and we would like to regain the paradise. So we would, from profane time, from secular time, we would like to go back once again to the sacred time or the holy space. And this is through rites and rituals. So, dear friends, so this is Messiah Eliade, a big name in the domain of mythology and, and the phenomenology of religion. Next, uh, all of us are familiar with Claude Levi Strauss because, as students of English language and literature, we are familiar with Claude Levi Strauss and maybe his essay, either Incest and Myth or the Structural Study of Myth, is included in our curriculum. Fine. Okay, who is Claude Lévi-Strauss? Okay, he lived from 1908 to 2009. So who is Claude Lévi-Strauss? I would like to say two things about Claude Lévi-Strauss. Number one, a French structural anthropologist, I repeat, a French structural anthropologist who spent 17, Malinowski spent only seven years, whereas Claude Lévi-Strauss spent 17 long years with a particular tribe in South America, collecting data and studying their culture and everything. So this is Claude Lévi-Strauss. But at the same time, as students of literature, Claude Lévi-Strauss is an anthropologist. Okay, but as students of literature, we are grateful to Claude Lévi-Strauss. Now, the reason is very simple. Who is the father of modern linguistics? Now, all of us know it was the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. Now, interestingly, the theories and insights of Saussure, the French linguist, the, the Swiss uh, linguist, did not come to the domain of literature studies directly. It came via anthropology, and it was Claude Lévi-Strauss who introduced the ideas, the theories, and the insights of Ferdinand de Saussure. In that sense, we owe a debt of gratitude to Claude Lévi-Strauss. Fine. Anyway, now let us come back. Okay, all that I want to say about Claude Lévi-Strauss and his contribution to mythology is just one sentence. Claude Lévi-Strauss had a message, a strong message, okay? A strong message backed by ideology, fine. Now, what was this message? Now, we living in the modern age, we somehow tend to dismiss the primitive societies, primitive cultures, and primitive men and women as people with no intelligence or less intelligence. Okay, 
So this is our tendency. Oh, that is a primitive society. Look at the word primitive, not developed, not well developed, primitive initial stages. So we tend to dismiss those men and women as belonging to a primitive society. Okay, not culture, not sophisticated, not developed. Okay, but Claude Levi Strauss sends out a very strong message. A myth is a strongly structured story. Do not dismiss a myth as a story dealing with some demons and some asuras and some animals. No, it is a strongly structured story. And the explication is, you, you look at how he has studied the Oedipus myth, borrowing the theories and insights of law of Ferdinand de so particularly the synchronic and the diachronic and uh, and uh, that uh, myth themes on the analogy of phoneme and uh, phoneme and lexeme he talks about the myth themes particularly the synchronic and the diachronic dimension fine okay so what he does is in the structural study of myth which is in two volumes he analyzes the myth of Oedipus from a structural linguistics point of view. And as students of literature, we know structural linguistics, the other name for structural linguistics is Sasurian linguistics. So using the theories and insights of Sasur, he analyzes the Oedipus myth. And then he comes to the conclusion, do not dismiss myths as fabulous stories. Do not dismiss primitive men and women as illiterates. No. Look at myth. It is a strongly structured story. Fine. Now, dear friends, all of us are aware of how Claude Lévi-Strauss analyzed the Oedipus myth from a structural linguistic point of view. But I want to give you one more example. Maybe some of you are aware of it. Maybe you are not aware of it. There is one more instance way Claude Lévi-Strauss has proved in a very convincing fashion that myth is a strongly structured story. I would request you to read the story of Asdeval. Okay, so this is roughly 53 pages with a beautiful introduction by Edmund Leach. Now, uh, I would like to quote the last sentence, the ultimate sentence of the essay, the story of Asdeval. So Claude Lévi-Strauss says, why did I undertake a structural analysis of the myth of Oedipus and the story of Asdeval? He says it is to prove, it is to demonstrate that the field of mythical thought too, look at the expression, the mythical thought too is structured because we tend to dismiss them as primitive. But then he says, no, the field of mythical thought too is structured. So this is Claude Lévi-Strauss and his structural analysis of myth. Next, I would like to talk about a French philosopher, a multifaceted, a multidimensional figure who died recently in 2005. So he was, uh, he was a French philosopher, semiologist, a literary critic, a linguist, a Bible scholar, a multifaceted and a multidimensional person. Now, for students of language and literature, I would like to talk about two books. He has a bulky book on metaphor, the rule of the metaphor, a bulky book, more than 400 pages. And towards the end of his life, he wanted to bring out a three-volume book on narratology. Okay, but then he was able to complete only the first two volumes, Time and Narrative. So now Paul Ricoeur, a French philosopher and anthropologist to some extent, okay, so he has written about myth and in 1967, he brought out a very important book called The Symbolism of Evil based on the Adamic myth. Okay, so it is here that he talks about his most important, uh, his most important contribution as far as the domain of mythology is concerned. He says, he says two things. Number one, modern men and women. Who are the modern men and women? You and I. Okay, so we are living in 2021, a pandemic period. Okay, he says we need myths. We certainly need myths, even though we are advanced, very advanced in science and technology, we still need myths. So that is the first statement. The second statement is we need myths but not 
in the pristine fashion or the pristine form. We need myths, but those myths have to be interpreted so that they become edible, palatable for the modern men and women that is you and me. So in other words, please look at the last line. He talked about the need, the important need for myth hermeneutics, about which I will talk towards the end of my presentation. Next, I would like to talk about Carl Jung very briefly. And the following slide talks about Northrop Frey because as students of language and literature, we associate Jung and Frey and then we club them together under the rubric or under the banner archetypal critics or archetypal criticism. So we have two very important archetypal critics, namely Carl Jung and Northrop Frey. Okay, Carl Jung. Okay, as far as the domain of mythology is concerned, Carl Jung has two important contributions. His contribution number one, as we all know, as students of uh, literature, because literature, psychology, okay, so the borderline is thin and porous and fudgy. Okay, so it was Carl Jung who talked about the collective unconscious. In fact, it was Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, who talked about the personal unconscious, but it was left to the mythical, asymplastic mind of Jung to expand the personal unconscious to the collective unconscious. So therefore his most important contribution as far as the domain of mythology is concerned is, it was Jung who talked about the collective unconscious mind. Now the question is, what exactly is the connection between the collective unconscious on the one hand and myths and archetypes on the other? Now, all of us as students of literature, we know what an archetype is. Okay, so in the following slide also, I'll be talking about archetypes with particular reference to Northrop Frey. We know an archetype is something recurrent, whether it is an archetypal character or an archetypal theme or an archetypal motif or an archetypal late motif. It is recurrent. And as Freud would say, with a certain degree of displacement, so that is archetype. Now let us go back to Jung. So Jung answered the question as to what exactly was the connection between archetypes on the one hand, archetypes and myths on the one hand, and the collective unconscious or the other. Now he put it in a single sentence beautifully, and he said, the collective unconscious serves as or provides the platform for myths and archetypes, particularly for archetypes to appear. So that was the connection or the association or the relation between the collective unconscious on the one hand and myths and archetypes on the other. So that was Carl Jung and his contribution to the domain of mythology. Fine. Now, dear friends, in this slide, I would like to very briefly talk about Northrop Fry, the Canadian critic, as we all know, Frey is an important archetypal critic, maybe the outstanding, the most outstanding archetypal critic. And I would like to refer to three publications of Northrop Frey, two books and an article. The books, as we all know, the book published by Princeton University in 1957. Anatomy of Criticism, Four Essays. I am sure as students of literature, we have all read this book, Anatomy of Criticism, Four Essays, published by Princeton in 1957. Then he has a collection of essays on different topics, including myth, literature. So the title of the book is Spiritus Mundi, and the subtitle is Essays on Literature, Myth, and Society. So these are two books that I would like to refer to because they have made an important contribution to the realm of mythology. Then, the, then I would like to refer to two essays, the archetypes of literature and literature as content Milton's Lycidas. Fine. Now it is in this essay, literature as context Milton's Lycidas, that we come across Fry's definition of archetype. So Fry writes, I quote, by an archetype, I mean a literary symbol or cluster of symbols which are used to recurrently, repeatedly, again and again throughout literature and thereby become conscious. Okay, fine. Now he says, 
Now, what exactly is Northrop Fry's vision of life and literature? As we all know, as students of literature, we are all familiar with this, particularly his essay, The Archetypes of Literature, and his book, Anatomy of Criticism, four essays, where he talks about his archetypal criticism as being based on, as being founded on the cyclical pattern on the one hand and the dialectical tension on the other. So I'll very briefly talk about it. So what it does is, in Anatomy of Criticism and in the Archetypes of Literature, he brings out or he talks about a synoptic vision of life and literature, a holistic vision of life and literature where everything is integrated, an integrated vision of life and literature. So he talks about four different cycles and he merges them, he synthesizes them, he puts them together. So what are the four cycles that he talks of? He talks of the seasonal cycle, he talks of the solar cycle, and he talks of the human cycle. And in the last column, he talks about the corresponding forms of literature. I'll give you just one example. Now, the solar cycle, we talk about uh, early morning, sunrise, dawn. Okay, then in the seasonal cycle, corresponding to dawn, corresponding to sunrise, we have the season of spring, the solar cycle. So there is a connection between spring and dawn. Then in the human cycle, we have birth, birth of the hero. So there is a connection between the solar cycle, the seasonal cycle, and the human cycle, and what would be the corresponding literary form? Spring is a time of joy. Birth, birth of a hero gives us joy. And early morning, sunrise, a new day, the beginning of a new day, that gives us joy. So obviously, we have rhapsodic poetry. Okay, so this would be the synoptic or the holistic vision of Northrop Frey. And the other one, dialectical tension. What is the dialectical tension? Okay, positive forces and negative forces. Okay, how it oscillates between the positive and the negative, life and death, day and night. Okay, so his archetypal theory is based on cyclical pattern and dialectical tension. Now that I have talked about Jung and Fry under the banner of archetypal criticism, I would like to answer one more interesting question. Now we see a lot of connection or points of convergence between Jung and Frey, but I will also like to highlight the divergence, the difference, the important difference between Frey and Jung. Now Frey did not get into much controversies as far as his archetypal criticism is concerned, okay? Or to put it a little differently, as an archetypal critic, he did not have to hit many roadblocks, okay? So he did not quote many controversies. Whereas Jung, he had to face a lot of controversies as far as his archetypal criticism is concerned. Now, the reason is Jung talked about the birth of the archetypes, the source of archetypes, and he said it is the collective unconscious, and therefore he got into controversy because the collective unconscious it is not empirical, it is not an observable phenomenon, and therefore he got into controversies. You could neither prove nor disprove the existence of the collective unconscious, whereas Fry, he was clever, he never answered questions about the origin of archetypes, and therefore did not face any controversy as far as his archetypal criticism is concerned. Okay, dear friends, I have two more experts to talk about in connection with mythology. Next, I would like to talk about a very interesting man, Joseph Campbell. So far, we have been talking about psychologists, we have been talking about anthropologists, we have been talking about philosophers. Okay, now for the first time, we will talk about a professor of English, an American, Joseph Campbell, who lived from 1904 to 1987. And he has two important books, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was published in 1968. And please take a look at the title. The title is Revealing the Hero with a Thousand Faces. In Indian tradition, we talk about God as one who has thousand or more than one thousand faces. I mean, meaning or implying that we can never fathom 
God. He is beyond our understanding. Okay, so you please read this book. But more than this particular book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, I would very strongly recommend the second book, which is in the form of a dialogue or a conversation. It was based on a series of interviews, The Power of Myths, which was published in 1988. And very striking and very insightful. Okay, fine. Now, who is Campbell? Okay, we need to answer this question before we take up his theory of mythology. Fine. Now, Campbell was a comparativist. Of course, earlier I said he was an American professor. He was a professor of English in an American institution. Okay, that apart. Okay, now how does he look at myths? How does he look at the domain of mythology as a comparativist? Okay, so what does uh, uh, in almost all colleges and all universities we have a paper on comparative literature? Okay, particularly the University of Jadavpur. I think uh, uh, they excel in the domain of comparative literature. So what do we do in comparative literature? We keep comparing different literatures, different traditions, different texts. So what did he do as a comparativist? He studied myths belonging to different societies, different religions, different cultures, and different traditions. And finally, he came to the conclusion that if you look at myths belonging to different cultures, religions, traditions, societies, you realize that basically the structure is the same. Okay, maybe superficially we have differences, but deep down they are not different, they are one and the same. That is why he writes, please look at the quote, whether the hero be ridiculous or sublime, Greek or barbarian, Gentile or Jew, his journey varies little, differs little in essential plan. And finally, the conclusion is, he talks of a mono myth, a single myth. Okay, we have hundreds of myths belonging to different traditions, different cultures, different societies, different religions. But as a comparative is, he reduces everything into one single myth, mono myth. Now, once again, as students of literature, we are all familiar with the term mono myth. We do realize that it was James Joyce who coined the term mono myth, and I'm sure uh, uh, we all know it was in his Finnegan's Wake, his last book. It was in his Finnegan's Wake that James Joyce coined the term mono myth. Okay, but from an anthropological point of view, this mono myth is based on. Arnold van Gennep's Rites of Passage. Okay, I have included Arnold van Gennep, but after Arnold van Gennep, it was Victor Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R, -E who talked about this. So, Rites of Passage, basically three stages, separation, margin, or liminal, liminality, and aggregation. So, he says, basically, fundamentally, deep down, all myths are same. They differ only in details, okay? But otherwise, structurally, it is one and the same. So, dear friends, we come to the last important author as far as mythology is concerned. So, this is Roland Barthes, a student of literature. We are all very familiar with Roland Barthes, so late from 1915 to 1918. In 1957, in French, Roland Barthes brought out mythologies and it was translated into English in 1972. And I'm sure all of you are aware of this book, Semiology of Myth 5. Now, what is the title of the book by Roland Barthes? It is Mythologies. Now, as a student of mythology, I would like to tell you straight away that the title is misleading. Okay, so what did I tell you? As a student of mythology, I would like to inform you that the title of the book by Roland Barthes is misleading. Because when you pick up this book, oh, it is mythology. What, what do you expect? You expect that Roland Barthes would be talking about Greek mythology or Roman mythology or uh, Egyptian mythology or Indian mythology. But then when you open the book, when you go through, flip through the pages, you realize it is not mythology from an anthropological or a sociological or a religious point of view. So which means 
the term mythologies as used to by Roland Barthes has an entirely different meaning or signification. Okay, so we should not confuse it with mythology as talked about by anthropologists, sociologists and philosophers here. That is why in the first chapter, Roland Bass makes it clear that he is not interested in mythologies in anthropological or philosophical or sociological or religious myths. He looks at myth as, please look at the first three lines as a type of speech, a system of communication and a mode of signification or form. In other words, he talks about signification Okay, let us go back to Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure talks about what is a linguistic sign or what is a verbal sign and what are the two dimensions or the two facets of a linguistic or a verbal sign. Saussure says a linguistic sign is composed of, number one, a signifier, which is acoustic and phonological and signify, which would be the referent. Okay, so here Roland Barthes argues if you take modern mythologies, particularly advertisements, okay, I'll give you some examples. You take advertisements, what happens? The signified of level one turns out to be the signifier of level two. And here is a quote from Roland Barthes. He writes, at the level of meta language, there is a collapse or surpassing of the literal or denotational meaning and there is the emergence of the symbolic or connotational meaning. In other words, let me give two examples. Okay, Roland Barthes talks about it. What does a soap advertisement sell? And what does a cigarette advertisement sell? Now a soap advertisement, does it sell a soap, a bathing soap, or does it sell beauty? A cigarette advertisement, does it sell a cigarette or does it sell manliness, a macho figure? Okay, so denotation, connotation. What is denotation? The literal meaning and what is connotation? The implied meaning, the figurative meaning, the metaphorical meaning. So this is about Roland Barthes. So dear friends, this is the second part of my presentation. I have come to the second part of my presentation. And as I said at the beginning, this is the core of my presentation. So I talked about uh, some seven important myth scholars. I started off with the Neo-Kantian Cassire, who says myth is a basic level, but an important stage in the evolution of any society or culture. Then I talked about Malinowski, who defines myth in terms of the normative role it plays, a functionalistic point of view. He defines myth as a pragmatic charter. Then I referred you to Missia Eliade, a Romanian, an expert in the domain of mythology and also in phenomenology of religion. He talks about three kinds of myths. And he talks about how man lost paradise and he wants to regain paradise and from profane time wants to get into sacred time once again. So that was Messia Eliade. Then I talked about Claude Lévi-Strauss and the structural anthropologies. I talked about Paul Ricker, who stresses the need for myth hermeneutics, who argues that modern men and women need myths, but not in its pristine form, but in a form that will be acceptable and edible to the modern men and women. And it is in this context that he talks about myth hermeneutics. Then I talked about two archetypal critics, Carl Jung and Northrop Fry. I talked about how Jung talks about the connection between the collective unconscious on the one hand and myths and archetypes on the other. And I highlighted uh, Fry's archetypal criticism as presenting a holistic or synoptic vision of life and literature. Then I talked about, <coughs> finally, I talked about Roland Bass. He talks about mythologies, but a different kind of mythologies, linguistic, where he talks about denotation and connotation, the way the signified of level one becomes the signified of level two. So dear friends, my presentation consists of four units.
I have pres I have completed the first two units. The first unit was what is myth, what are the characteristics of myth. The second unit was the contribution of various myth scholars to the study and understanding of myths. Now in the third unit, I have three slides. Very briefly, I would like to highlight the connection, the important connection that exists between myth and literature. Now, Lage, Vincent B. Lage, he talks about three kinds of connection between myth and literature. Number one, he talks about a thematic connection between myth and literature. Number two, he talks about a formal or a structural connection between myth and literature. And three, lastly, he talks about a cultural connection between myth and literature. Fine. Now, very briefly, I would like to explicate these three kinds of connections that exist between myth and literature. Fine. Now, what about the thematic connection? Lake says, myth, like literature, is concerned with perennial topics. Now, you take a great literary text, whether they are poems or novels or dramas or even films. Okay. Some of the best films, some of the best literary texts, some of the best novels, some of the best poems. They address, they deal with, they interrogate perennial topics. And what are perennial topics? Questions like what is life? What is man? What is death? Okay. Extraordinary birth or a virgin birth. Okay. Then deluge. Okay. So you take Indian tradition, you take the Western tradition. They talk about these perennial topics. So therefore, Leach would argue there exists a thematic connection between myth and literature because like literature, myth too deals with, is concerned with perennial topics, lasting topics, topics, issues that grip humanity as a whole. Fine. So that is the thematic connection. Now, Leish would also argue that in addition to the thematic connection between myth and literature, there is a formal or there is a structural connection between myth and literature. I would like to give you two good examples. You take uh, James Joyce's a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, or you take uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. He will raise two questions. Now, the first question, as far as Ulysses is concerned, and as far as a Portrait of the Artist is concerned, from where? Did James Joyce borrow the theme or the story? Now, the answer is obvious. As far as Ulysses is concerned, we know the story of Ulysses is borrowed from Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus is the Greek name and Ulysses is the Roman name. Okay, fine. So the material, the story, the plot, the material has been borrowed from Greek mythology as far as Ulysses is concerned, Joyce as Ulysses is concerned. Now, what about Joyce's a portrait of the artist as a young man? So the central person, the protagonist is a young man, a young university student called Stephen Dedalus. Okay, so Dedalus, we have the mythological story of Dedalus and his son Icarus, how they fabricated wings and they escaped out of an island, okay, flapping their wings. But then what happened? Icarus being young and a little hot-tempered, he tried to fly higher and higher and went close to the sun. And please remember when Icarus and his father, Daedalus, when they fabricated wings, they fastened the wings onto their backs with the help of bats. Okay, so Icarus, as he flew higher and higher, what happened? As he went closer and closer to the sun, the heat of the rays of the sun, they melted the wax, so the wings came apart and then he crashed into the sea. Fine. Now let us go back to the question. Okay, from where did James Joyce get the story, get the raw material for his portrait of the artist as a young man? Now the answer is Greek mythology, the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. So whether it is Joyce's Ulysses or Joyce's a portrait of the artist as a young man, the source is Greek mythology. Fine. Now, the theme is from Greek mythology. Fine. Now, look at the way the plot has been structured, whether it is a portrait of the artist as a young man or Ulysses. Look at the way the plot develops. Look at the way the plot unfolds. And then you realize 
that there is a close parallel between the Greek mythology and Joyce's story, not only in terms of the story, not only in terms of the raw material, but also the way the plot unfolds. So which means as far as Joyce's Ulysses is concerned and as far as Joyce's the portrait of the artist is concerned, not only is there a thematic connection between myth and literature, there is also a formal, a structural, because the scaffolding has been provided by mythology. So there is a thematic connection with the reference to Joyce's Ulysses. In addition to the thematic connection, there is also a formal, the form it takes, the structure, the scaffolding that is also borrowed from mythology. So Leish talks about the thematic connection. He also talks about the formal or the structural connection and then he rounds off the discussion by talking about the cultural connection. What is the end of literature? What is the ultimate aim of literature? And what is the end of mythology? What is the ultimate aim of mythology? And then we, 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 we realize that there is a reinforcement of these objectives. Okay, both try to do the same. So that is why Leish would write, culturally, myths and literature functioned as essential narratives imparting man knowledge and wisdom while reinforcing social and spiritual beliefs, okay? So dear friends, the question is, myths, literature, literary texts, how do we map the connection between these two domains? So we turn to Vincent Leach and he says, number one, there is a thematic connection. Number two, there is a formal or a structural connection. And number three, as far as the function of literary texts and the function of mythological texts, he talks about the cultural connection between myth and literature. Fine. Now, with specific reference to texts, they could be plays or they could be poems or they could be novels. So, with very specific reference to literary texts, let us raise this question once again. What is the connection between myth and literature? Or let me reframe the question. How do literary texts use ancient myths? Okay, how do literary texts, how do novels, how do dramas, how do poems use mythological texts, mythologies, myths in the form and configuration file? Now, experts would talk of three categories. Okay, so what is that? Number one, retelling of an ancient myth. Number two, a veiled, a concealed reference to an ancient myth. And number three, a thematic and a structural model. Okay, for each category, I have given two examples, fine. Now we have the ancient myth. What is this ancient myth? We have the myth of Orestes. Okay, and who is the author? Aeschylus. <clears throat> I'm sure as students of literature, we are all familiar with the story of Orestes. So if you go to Greek mythology as students of literature, Two stories are very famous, of course, there are other stories, but what are the two stories? The myth of Oedipus and the myth of Orestes, okay, so by Aeschylus, okay, and uh, the, the myth of Oedipus is in three parts, I'll go back to the previous slide, okay, so what are the three parts? As we all know, in ancient times, the tragedy consisted of three parts, so it was three in one, it was composite, so the first part of the story is titled Agamemnon. The second part of the story is titled the libation bearers and the third part of the story is titled Eumenides. Okay, so what happens? I'm sure you know the story. So the story goes like this. Agamemnon was a general, a military general. He took part in the Trojan War and uh, we know the Trojan War was for 40 years and we, we, we know the story, Troy of Helen and, 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 and all the other stuff. So what happens is after the Trojan War, Agamemnon, a military general, he returns home victorious. Okay, but the moment he returns home, the moment he sets foot on his own, what happened? Instead of welcoming him, his wife, that is Clytemnestra, murders him. And 
Clytemnestra murders her husband Agamemnon with the help of her illicit lover Aegisthus. So this is the first part. So Agamemnon, a military general, takes part in the Trojan War, the 40-year Trojan War. He comes home victorious, but as soon as he sets foot on, uh, on his own, he is murdered by his own wife Clytemnestra, who murders her husband with the help of her lover Aegisthus. So this is the first part of the story. The second part, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, they have two children, a young man and a young woman. Orestes is the young man and Electra is the young woman, Orestes' sister. Okay, as students of literature and psychology, we are familiar with the term Electra complex, Oedipus complex and Electra complex. So what happens? The father has been murdered and they want to avenge the death of their father. So Orestes and Electra kill Clytemnestra, that is their own mother and her lover Aegisthus. So this is the second part. Now what happens? In Greek mythology, we hear of the Furies, okay, autochthonous and evil spirits, okay, not, not exactly evil, furious spirits, okay. So what happened? Because of matricide, okay, so there, you, 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 if you read the last part, there is a very interesting discussion. Okay, so killing of the husband or killing of the mother. So which is a more heinous crime? Okay, so there is an interesting discussion towards the, uh, uh, towards the end of the drama that is in the third part. Anyway, now the story is, as soon as Orestes with the help of Electra kills his own mother, that is Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus, he is chased by the Furies. Then he takes ref uh, refuge in a temple. Then there is an unending conversation. So what happens was the result is the Furies become kind and protective. And the best part of the drama is towards the end. We find that democracy is established. Fine. Now let me go back to the previous slide. So what happens? You take a Jean-Passat's drama of flies and Girish Karnad's The Fire and the Rain. Girish Karnad has a long introduction and there he makes it very clear. My story is a retelling of the myth of Orestes. Okay, so we have two examples, Sartre's jean paul Sartre's Flies and Girish Karnad's The Fire and the Rain. So both are different versions or adaptations of an ancient myth. And what is this ancient myth? The myth of Orestes by Aeschylus. So this is the first category. Now the second category, you take up uh, D.H. Lawrence's novel, much acclaimed novel, Sons and Lovers and Eliot's, the worst drama, the poetic drama, the family reunion. Now experts tell us in both these texts, the novel, the novel by D.H. Lawrence and the drama by T.S. Eliot, they will talk of a mythical subtext. But then you look at the novel, there is absolutely no reference to any myth or any mythological hero or any protagonist. Okay, there is absolutely no reference to any mythology in Sons and Lovers. In Eliot's The Family Reunion also, there is absolutely no mention, no reference to any mythology whatsoever. So therefore, the second category is, look at the first word, a veiled reference, an indirect reference, an implicit reference, uh, an oblique reference to an ancient myth. Whereas in the first category, the story is about myth, okay, but it has been retold. It has it is an adaptation. Whereas with reference to Lawrence's Sons and Lovers and Eliot's The Family Reunion, okay, there is a mythical subtext which is oblique, which is indirect. Now, in the third category, I have already talked about the third category. I have already talked about how in Ulysses and also in a portrait of the artist as a young man, there is a thematic connection. And not only is there a thematic connection, but there is also a structural, a formal and a structural connection. So, which means the question is, how do literary texts use myth? Now, we have three answers. An ancient myth. It is retold, it is adapted, and I have given two examples. Or so you take literary texts, 
on the surface of it, it looks like there is absolutely no reference to mythology. But then if you look deeper, if you look at the subtext, you do realize that there is a mythical substratum. And if you look at novels like a portrait and Ulysses, you realize that not only is there a thematic connection, but there is also a formal and a structural connection. Fine. Okay, fine. Now what happened is I talked about uh, the myth of Orestes by Aeschylus and I narrated the story how the general Agamemnon is murdered by his own wife and her lover and how she was killed by her own son and daughter and how the Furies chased both of them, particularly Orestes and fine and finally how he was rescued and how democracy was established. Fine. Now this story has been dealt with by three people, okay, maybe more, but I am aware of three versions. We have the American playwright O'Neill. If you take Morning Becomes Electra, the entire play is based on, is modeled on the Greek Orestes and you have Jopa Sachs, The Flies, which is also modeled on Orestes and we have the Indian playwright dramatist Girish Karnats, The Fire and the Rain, way in his prologue, he makes it clear that the story is modeled on Orestes. So dear friends, that was the third section. Now we go to the final section. Okay, so in the last part, in the last section, I would like to talk about hermeneutics, but myth hermeneutics. Now before we talk about myth hermeneutics, I would like to very briefly because hermeneutics itself is the topic for another lecture. Okay, but what exactly is hermeneutics and how is hermeneutics defined? Okay, so I would like to offer you three definitions of hermeneutics, particularly from a philosophical point of view. Okay, so in general, hermeneutics is defined as Okay, in general, hermeneutics has been defined as a theory of understanding or a theory of interpretation. Now, students of literature immediately will ask me, okay, all critical theories, what do they do? They are also theories of understanding. They are also theories of interpretation. What is feminism? What is structuralism? What is deconstruction? What is postmodernism? They are also theories of understanding. They are also theories of interpretation. So in which case, how is hermeneutics different from, or how is hermeneutics marked off from other theories of understanding and other theories of interpretation? So it is in this context that I would like to offer you two crisp definitions of hermeneutics. The first is taken from Paul Ricker, who in 1974 in Philosophy Today published an article called What is Hermeneutics? So there he defines hermeneutics as the theory of the operation of understanding of text. So here he narrows it down to text. Okay, you have a text. It could be a literary text. It could be a philosophical text. It could be a biblical text. So how do you try to interpret the text? or how do you try to understand the text? Okay, so Paul Ricoeur, he talks about the theory, hermeneutics as the theory of the operation of understanding with reference to text. Okay, and what does he mean by text? He says it could be a religious text, it could be a philosophical text, or it could be a literary text. So this is Paul Ricoeur and his definition of hermeneutics. But then we have one more definition of hermeneutics, and that would be the canonical definition of hermeneutics. It is the German philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer. In 1960, he wrote a book bearing the title Truth and Method and it was translated into English in 1975. So Truth and Method, it is in three parts, supposed to be a brilliant book. So please read this book if you have time. The title is Truth and Method. It is by a German philosopher called Hans Georg Gadamer. I'm sure those of you who are interested in, or those of you who are familiar with reader response theory, particularly the German version 
reception aesthetics jaws j a u s s i am sure in that connection you must have studied about gardamer because jaws associated with the reception school of aesthetics he was a student of gardamer he was a disciple of gardamer okay so gardamer in his book truth and method and then in the first part of the book he defines hermeneutics as the understanding of understanding itself now earlier i raised this question if you define hermeneutics as a theory of understanding or a theory of interpretation how do you mark it off from other theories other critical theories which also deal with understanding and interpretation it is here gardner steps in and says other theories talk about understanding with reference to something for instance understanding a text okay understanding a poem understanding a novel understanding a drama understanding a short story but then he says the concern of hermeneutics is a little different of course it is also involved in the understanding of a text but more than the understanding of text hermeneutics is interested in and hermeneutics is involved in the understanding of understanding itself so in that sense it is self reflexive it is inward looking it is not understanding with relation to a text but more importantly in a self reflexive manner it is understanding of understanding itself so this is how hermeneutics has been defined okay fine now i have two more slides <coughs> now here the point is what is myth hermeneutics okay fine now i have two slides so i'll be very brief so what happens is uh we have a concept called demythologization okay and who is the originator who is the pioneer as far as demythologizing is concerned it was a german theologian i repeat it was a german theologian he was an existentialist philosopher and theologian called rudolf bultmann he has written a number of books on this it was he who not only introduced the term but also popularized the term demythologization okay so what is this demythologization okay in other words you decontextualize it i repeat you decontextualize it and then you recontextualize it in other words you pluck it off from one area from one field and replant it in another field or in another area so this is demythologizing so what happens in demythologizing two things happen number one he here bultmann makes it very clear the myth is not eliminated the myth is not destroyed the myth is not wiped out but the myth is given a new form a new shape a new configuration so therefore bultmann talking about demythologizing the enterprising of the, the enterprise of demythologizing he writes the myth is not eliminated instead it is interpreted and when it is interpreted it is given a new form it is given a new shape and it is given a new lease of life in other words we can equate demythologization with secularization okay now what about the modern men and women okay you take our own people okay those who are attending this lecture okay maybe some of you believe in god some of you do not believe in god some are theists some are atheists some are agnostics okay and then we are all men of science and technology even though we are students of literature we are all men and women of science and technology so therefore listening to these stories where a horse can fly or where somebody can do this somebody can do that where this happens that happens like uh, we say so oh, come on these are all these are all incredible stories unbelievable stories they do not stand to reason they are irrational okay so it is in this context that we need myth hermeneutics it is in this context that we realize the need for interpreting the stories and decontextualizing them and recontextualizing in other words they need to be secularized now the important question is why should they be secularized they should be secularized because the modern men and women they are steeped in a culture of rationality they are steeped in a culture of science they are steeped in a culture of 
technology. So to these men and women, if myths have to make any sense, then they need to be secularized. And what is the meaning of secularization from a linguistic point of view? I already talked about with reference to Ferdinand de Saussure, how he talks about the linguistic sign and the two dimensions of the linguistic sign, namely the signifier and the signifier. So in other words, myth hermeneutics can be explained in a single sentence, ancient signifier, but modern signifier. I repeat, ancient, primitive signifier, but modern or contemporary signified. In other words, I'll refer you to James Joyce's letters. Now, as students of literature, we are all familiar with this. James Joyce has written novels. He has also written short stories, Dubliners. He also has a drama to his credit. Of course, not a very interesting drama, but his letters are very interesting. They have been collected in two volumes and published fine. Now, when, now this is a letter that talks about what happened when Joyce was writing his Ulysses. And the period is 1920, the month of September. So on the 21st of September, 1920, Joyce's publisher, an Italian, Carlo Linati, wrote a letter to James Joyce. Mr. Joyce, what is your new work? What are you working on? Can you share with me some details? Okay, so this was from his publisher, an Italian, Carlo Linati. Now Joyce wrote back, oh, you asked me what I am doing now. Okay, I am working on a new novel. This is a new project. Then the publisher wrote back, oh, you're working on a new novel. Please tell me what is it about? Okay, then in the course of the letter, James Joyce writes, please read the first two lines. My intention, this is, he was writing Ulysses. So his publisher obviously must have asked him, now what is the purpose in talking about the Greek myth of Ulysses? Okay, so what is your aim? What is your objective? What is your intention? So James Joyce wrote back, this is when he was writing his Ulysses. My intention is to transpose the myth sub specie temporis nostri. So what did he write? What was the question? Mr. Joyce, you tell me that you're working on a new project, that you're writing a new novel and you would like to call it Ulysses. I would like to know more about this project. So why? What is the reason? What is the purpose? What is the intention? So he says, Joyce wrote back, saying that my intention was to transpose the myth, transpose the myth of Ulysses or Odysseus, sub specie temporis nostri. Sub specie temporis nostri is, is a Latin expression, which means, literally it means sub under, okay, under the vision of our times. In other words, if you interpret it, if you translate it in a broad sense, it means, I would like to take an ancient mythological story and make it contemporary. Okay, so what did he do? He took an ancient story, but gave it a new name, gave it a new setting, gave it a new dress. So he secularized it. More than secularizing, he made it contemporary. So he said, my intention is to transpose the myth sub specie temporis nostri. So he decontextualized it. He removed it out of the original context and then he recontextualized it. Where did he contextualize it? The original story took place in Greece, whereas Joyce's Ulysses takes place in Dublin. Okay, so he decontextualized it and then he recontextualized it. So this is myth hermeneutics. Okay, so this is demythologizing it. When you demythologize, what do you do? You secularize it, but more than secularizing, you give it a modern name, a modern setting, a contemporary name, a contemporary setting. And something similar was written by T.S. Eliot, because in 1922, we have the publication of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And a little after that, we have the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses. And that time, T.S. Eliot was the editor of The Dial, the journal. So he wrote in the dial in an article called Ulysses Order on Myth. He talks about the mythic method. 
okay, famously known as the mythic method. So he says, Mr. Joyce's parallel use of the Odyssey. And what does he mean? A continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity. Okay, so this is the mythic method. And my last slide. Now, two things are clear. Number one, if the modern men and women have to believe in ancient myths, have to believe in primitive myths, they have to be decontextualized. They have to be demythologized. But there is a challenge. What is this challenge? Okay, I'm referring to a brilliant article by a German called Eva Kushner, okay, who wrote in an article called German Myths and Modern Drama, Paths of Transformation. So there she wrote, when you talk of the project of demythologization, she says, there is a tension, there is a dialectical tension between fidelity or faithfulness to the original and the element of change. Okay, you cannot change the story. Okay, so he, who kills Agamemnon? It is his wife. You cannot change it. Who kills Clytemnestra? It is Oedipus. That you cannot change. Okay, then how does the drama end? The Furies become kindly ones. That you cannot change. So, which means when you decontextualize and recontextualize, see to it that you do not tamper with the original. There has to be fidelity or faithfulness to the original. But at the same time, we have to bring in changes. We have to make it modern. We have to make it contemporary. So you need to balance this. So therefore, this is a tricky project. Okay, why? There is a dialectical tension between fidelity or faithfulness to the original and the element of change, you need to balance this. And finally, I would like to end as a student of mythology. Okay, people have asked me, do you believe in myths? And people have also asked me as a student of mythology, okay, do modern men and women need myths? Okay, I would like to end with two quotes. The first one has been taken from a beautiful book. I am sure you have read the book. It is only 150 pages, The Birth of Tragedy. The title is a little misleading. The title says birth of tragedy. No, it is birth of tragedy and comedy. He talks about the Apollonian and the Dionysian trends. Okay, so here Nietzsche writes, every culture that has lost myth has lost by the same token, its natural, healthy creativity. And then Nietzsche says, modern men and women today stripped of myth they stand famished and impoverished. Look at the word. They stand famished and impoverished. And in order to replenish this, they have to go back to their mythical past. So which means, this is how I would like to conclude, okay? Quoting the words of Paul Ricker, modern men and women, you and I, whether we believe in religion or not, whether we believe in gods and goddesses or not, okay? We need myths but not in a pristine form. We need myths as they are interpreted so that they speak our language, so that it becomes intelligible to us. Okay, so this is how I would like to end. And finally, very briefly, I would like to give you a brief list of reference books. Okay, I am sure you have most of these books in your library. Okay, so Lawrence Coupe, Okay, this is a monograph with the title Myth, a Rutledge publication. Then Martin S. Day, The Many Meanings of Myth. This is a good book. I have also written a book with the title Myth and Literature that was in 2003. Then the next is a brilliant book, Alan Dundas. This is an edited volume, 1984 publication, a collection of essays, sacred narrative readings in the theory of myth. And uh, you have Nothrofry, you have Writer. Now, I would strongly recommend the book by K.K. Ruthwan, Monograph, even though it was published way back in 1976. It is a brilliant book, very readable. And of course, Vicari's edited volume, that is a brilliant one, Myth and Literature, Contemporary Theory and Practice. And this is the cover page of my own book. So, dear friends, that was my presentation in four parts. In the first part, I had answered the question, what is myth and what are the characteristics of myth? In the second part, I drew your attention 
I talked about the theories of important myth scholars, their important publications and their important theories and insights. In the third part, I spelled out, I mapped the connection between myth on the one hand and literature on the other. And towards the end of my presentation, I talked about, I highlighted the need for myth hermeneutics, our modern men and women, okay? Looking for our roots, we need myths, but myths not in the pristine form, but myths in a different form. So we need to demythologize them. Okay, fine. So maybe some questions for 10 minutes. Over to Dr. Nirmalaya. So thank you, dear friends, for patiently listening to me. And once again, my very special thanks to Dr. Nirmalaya. Dr. Lata and Dr. Shruti Jain. Thank you. Thank you very much. In case there are